And we need to be willing to embrace that and pray that. We're excited today to have Brother J Jared James as our preacher. Uh, Jared is a native of Shakota, Oklahoma, uh, three years ahead of Carrie Underwood, he told me. Uh, graduated there, went to Oklahoma Baptist University, graduated there, and then went to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and graduated there. Uh, we went to the same school together to, uh, 30 years apart, and uh, it's a great seminary. He got his MDiv there. Uh, married uh, Sarah. They've been married 13 years. They have three precious children, Kai and Grace and Luke. You need to meet them if you have not. You have your parents and grandparents with us who've come from Shakota. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you. I pray that the Lord will enrich you for having been with us. You certainly enriched us for coming here. Jared has pastored for nine years. He is in between pastorates right now. One of the things we need to do is pray for him, pray for Sarah as the Lord leads and opens up. He's currently uh, working in child protective services in Tulsa County. His heart, though, is to preach the gospel, to pastor God's people. And Jared, I've preached to these people for ten and a half years. Uh, they, they bring it out of you. They love to hear the truth. They don't wince at it. And so I'm excited for you to get to preach to these people. We're excited to hear you and be blessed by what God's put on your heart. Would you come, brother, and preach? I want to pray over you when you come. <clears throat> Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, bless your servant this day. Open his mouth, and from his lips, enable him by your Spirit to preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. To lift him up. We pray for all of us here that, as our brothers already mentioned, we'll be not only hearers of the word, but, but embrace the word to be doers of the word. That you'll deal with us where we need to be dealt with, whether we need to be encouraged, encourage us, where we need to be rebuked, rebuke us. Lift it up, lift us up, humble us, humble us, Lord. And then for those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior yet, we pray that today would be the day that they will see Jesus. And confess Him as Lord. Be brought into the family of faith. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Well, it's a great privilege to be here today, to be able to stand before you and bring God's Word. I don't take that as something lightly. Um, it is a, a weighty matter uh, to bring God's Word to God's people. And I always want to make sure that I preach truth and uh, preach God's Word. Uh, because it is in God's Word that there is power, it is a living uh, Word, it is a sharp Word that will convict, and a Word that will encourage and build up the body of Christ. And I want to thank Brother Bill for giving me the opportunity uh, to preach this morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to ask that you would turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, and this morning we're going to look at verses 13 through 16. And I want to ask that when you have found your place, if you're able to, if you will stand for the reading of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Peter says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, oh Father, I pray and I ask that you would give me the words to say this morning. I pray that you would anoint me, Father, to preach your word. And Father, I pray that this service would not be about me or anyone else, but about You. And I pray that You would take the Word that is preached, and I pray that, Father, You would accomplish all that You will for it this morning to accomplish. I pray that You will save those who are lost. And for everyone in this room that is a Christian, I pray, Father, that our hearts would be stirred to live as a holy people in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Father, be with us this morning and we just invite Your Spirit to come and to apply these words to our lives. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
I'm sure of you, many of you have probably been watching the news. I don't watch it as much as I used to. I just get frustrated. But this past week, I'm sure you heard of Obama's announcement to all the public schools in America to allow transgender students to use bathrooms and locker rooms that coincide with their chosen gender identity. Now, I don't want to get caught up in all of that this morning, but one of the things that that did for me is when I heard that, two things came to mind. First of all, I was reminded of the, the society that we live in, of how fast it is becoming a pagan society. And the second thing that it did, that, that announcement did for me is it caused me to think much deeper about what type of people we are to be in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, this world around us, this sin-cursed world. What type of people are we to be? Well, I think that the passage before us this morning in 1 Peter answers that question. In fact, the entire book of 1 Peter answers that question. How we are to live as Christians in the midst of a pagan society, in a sin-cursed world. Well, before we dive into this passage of Scripture this morning, I want to give you a little bit of the context. Um, typically, I preach through books of the Bibles, but I'm not doing this, this mo- that this morning. Um, so I want to give you kind of an overview of what's going on, since um, we've got limited uh, time here in, this, uh, in just these few verses. First of all, this was a letter that was written approximately somewhere around 30-some years after the death of Christ. It was written by the Apostle Peter, and evidence suggests that he was in Rome when he was writing. And he writes to uh, uh, several different groups of believers that are scattered all throughout what is known as modern-day Turkey. Uh, Turkey. These Christians were scattered uh, throughout this vast area, um, all except for the southern uh, region. And the recipients of this letter, we don't quite know if they were all Jews or all Gentiles, but given the language uh, that Peter uses in describing uh, their former life before they were Christians, it's possible that many of them were Gentiles. The language that he also used uses to describe these Christians, it sounds like they could be Jews. But whether they were Jews or Gentiles, I believe here that there was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles that he was writing to. But were one thing is clear about this group of believers that Peter writes to. He calls them, in the first uh, verse of chapter 1, he calls them the elect exiles. He, these believers were sojourners in this world. This world was not their home. And these sojourners, these elect exiles, as we see is if we read all throughout the book of 1 Peter, we find that these exiles, these foreigners in a hostile world, they were home, they were living in a pagan, godless, hostile society that was full of trials and persecutions and temptations and suffering. And it was for this reason that they needed encouragement. And so Peter writes. Now, when Peter writes this uh, letter to these group of, this group of believers that are scattered abroad, there's three themes that, that I see in 1 Peter when I read through it. First of all, he starts in chapter 1 before he gets into anything about what they should do or how they should live. He reminds them of the Gospel. He reminds them of what God the Father has done for them through Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 3, and 5, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through a faith being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So first of all, he reminds him of this great salvation that God the Father has accomplished through Jesus Christ. The second thing that he does, if we look all throughout 1 Peter, is he reminds them of the hope that they have as exiles. Of the hope that they have as people who are being persecuted in this world. Throughout 
1 Peter, this hope comes in the form of the return of Christ. That day when the grace that, that God has given to us will be fully realized. He will bring this grace to us through Jesus Christ at His coming. In five chapters, and if I counted right, he refers to the second coming of Christ anywhere from 11 to 12 times in, in just five chapters. And then the third thing that he does, he's reminded us of our inheritance. He has reminded us of the second coming of Christ. And third, he reminds us that in light of the hostile world around us, and the devil who is prowling around like a roaring lion, and the sinful flesh that we still carry around in this present world, Peter reminds them of what kind of lives they are to live in this world as children of God. And what kind of life is that? They are to live a holy life. They are to live a life of conduct that gives praise and honor and glory to God. And that's what we see here this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. He's laid out in the first half what God's done for them through Christ. And now we begin in this passage beginning in verse 13. Look, if you will, in verse 13. He says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being so set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, in this passage of Scripture, all the way to verse 16, in 16 and, or 15 and 16, he's talking about how we have to live holy lives. But here's how we prepare to do that. And we find it in verse 13. First of all, we are to prepare our minds. Or as some translations, if you have the New King James Version, it says that we are to gird up the loins of our minds. Some of you may be asking, well, how in the world do we do that? What is Peter talking about here when he says that we are to prepare our minds for action or we are to gird up the loins of our minds? Well, we have to go back and look at the ancient customs of the day and how they, the way they did things. We know that the men in those days, they wore long garments and that kind of flowed around the ankles and around the legs. And we know that when they would go to war or when they would run, they would pull up this garment and they would tuck it in their belt. So nothing would hinder them in battle. Nothing would hinder them when they would run. And that's what Peter is doing. He's borrowing from that imagery. He's borrowing from that picture of girding up the loins so that you can be prepared for action. He's borrowing that imagery and he's giving us a picture of what state the believer's mind should be in at all times. We are to prepare our minds for action. And in the context, the idea here is that we are to be mentally prepared for combat, for action. We are to be mentally prepared for action in the realm of holiness. You see, when we are saved, we are set apart. We are made holy because of what Christ has done. But it doesn't end there. We are called to live holy lives. Now that God has done the, the, the primary work, He gives us the grace to go on and to continue to live holy lives. Sanctification. We are to become more and more like Christ as believers. And that's what Peter is getting at here. And how do we do that? We prepare our minds. We cannot be slothful, but we must prepare our minds for action. You know, as Christians, we are in a battle. If you haven't realized that, then you're probably not a Christian. Because Christianity is a battle. You see, when we are saved, it's not time to just sit back and go idly through life and just wait for our home in heaven. No, the moment we are saved, the battle truly begins. I remember as a young boy, when I first got saved, I remember that, uh, that God had saved me from my sins and had forgiven me of all my sins and I was just so overwhelmed by the reality that I am clean. And immediately, a thought popped in my head. I, I heard this, just this voice go through my head and I know that it was the enemy. And immediately, I realized 
that war was, was uh, being waged. I realized that I was in a battle. That the game, that before I was just walking through life passively, but now I am at war because I'm a Christian. And that is the way it is for every Christian. As Christians, we are in a battle. Unless we have forgotten this, the bega battle begins in our minds. What we think about determines how we live. Let me show you just for a second what I mean. Before we are a Christian, listen to how the Scriptures describe our minds. 1 Timothy 6.5, our minds are called depraved minds when we are unbelievers. 1 Timothy 3.8 says we are men corrupted in mind. 5 says those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says the God of this world has blinded the mind of unbelievers. Philippians 3.19 says that our minds are set on earthly things as unbelievers. But now, but now that we are a Christian, our mind has been set free from that bondage of sin. Now we have been set free through what Christ has done. And that is why we hear the, the, uh, the call to to have a mind that is set upon things above, as Paul says in Colossians 3. That is why in Romans 12, 2, Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's why in Ephesians 4, 23, we, are, we see that we are to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And here in 1 Peter, Peter uses that same language. Prepare your minds for action. Prepare for the battle that is being fought. As Christians, we are not to go on thinking as we once did. We must wake up every morning and remember that we are at war. We cannot sit back and go idly through life. We are at war with the world because the world wants to conform us to its mold. We are at war with the flesh because we still carry around this body of death. We are also at war with Satan who is always carrying out some kind of campaign against our souls. So as believers, we wage this war and we begin this war fighting it by preparing our minds for action. There's no time for pacifism in the Christian life. There is no time for letting down our guard, but we must prepare our minds for actions. We must guard what enters our minds what we see, what we think about, what we hear, what we watch on TV, what we listen to on the radio, and even when we're by our, ourselves, we must be careful about the thoughts that enter our minds. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we are to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I like what J.C. Ryle says. I've been reading his book on holiness. He says of the Christian battle for holiness. He says, He is not meant to live a life of religious ease. The, that is the Christian. He is not to live a life of religious ease or indolence and security. He must never imagine for a moment that he can sleep and doze along the way to heaven. Like one traveling in an easy carriage. If he takes his standard of Christianity from the Christ children of this world, he may be content with such notions, but he will find no countenance for them in the Word of God. If the Bible is the rule of faith and practice, he will find his course laid down very plainly in the matter. He must fight. That's what we are to do as Christians. But he goes on here a bit further, Peter does, in 1 Peter 1.13. Not only are we to prepare our minds for action, but he goes on to say we're to be sober-minded. Now Peter here is not giving us a, a, a lecture on sobriety, abstaining from alcohol. That's not what he's talking about here. Though the Scripture speaks to that, that we shouldn't be drunk with wine. But here we find him using this idea of being sober-minded. He's using it in a spiritual sense. In other words, we're not to go around sluggish. We're not to go around with our minds on the things of this world. But we are to have our minds sober and alert. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 12.35. He says that we are to watch and we are to pray. We are not to be sluggish. The same word is used in 1 Peter 
uh, 5.8, which we find at the end of 1 Peter. He says there, he says, Be sober, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now think about that for a second in the context of a roaring lion and this word being sober-minded. If there's a lion outside in the hallway, it would be kind of foolish just to have our, our, our heads in the clouds and just to walk out there in the hallway, lest we be devoured and we become uh, food for that lion. We wouldn't go, want to be goofing off around a lion, would we? We wouldn't want to be goofing off or, or we would want to be looking out for it. We would want to be alert lest we become dead meat. And that's what Peter is saying here. We are, to, we are to prepare our minds for action and we are to be sober minded. The point is, we live in enemy territory. We live in a world where it is so easy to get sucked into its cares, the cares of life. In our world that we live in, think about how many things in this world can draw our attention away from eternal matters. As Americans, I think we have been blessed in many ways to have so much. But many times those blessings can also, in some ways, be a bad thing. Because as Americans, and I've seen this when I've been in other places in the world, you see believers who have nothing, and I mean, they're just so eager to be in God's Word. And here we come to America and we have five Bibles on our shelves. We have all the books in the world that we could read on, about Christianity. We have all this internet access to, to guides to help us to study the Bible. And yet, in America, it seems like the American church is nothing but asleep. Because we have so many things to distract us. We have, for example, we have money. There's nothing wrong with money and riches. It can, but they are dangerous if we have a love for money. You think, I think about the church in Revelation chapter 4. The church at Laodicea. There Christ was on the outside knocking on the door. And here they were. They had everything. So they thought. But they didn't have the main thing. And that was Christ. They were so content with the world's goods that they didn't even see their own poverty. We can, as, as ladies, you guys... There's nothing wrong with having nice clothes and jewelry. But what does Peter say in chapter 3? He wants the ladies, these women who have unbelieving husbands, he tells them that they are to not let their adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold and jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be hidden, the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight very precious. You see, there's nothing wrong with looking nice. But we must make sure that our focus is on a God and living a holy life instead of being caught up in all of the vanity of this world. There's so many things. Recreation is good to help rejuvenate the soul to, that we might be fit for the service of God, that we could have our souls refreshed. But it must not become our God. It must not be what we live for. We must live for God. As Christians, we must constantly be preparing our minds for action and we must be sober and not be drugged down by the things and the cares of this world. You think, what, think about the parable of the soil or the soils. Think about the things that choke the Word of God out. The cares of this life. We must be sober-minded, as Peter calls us to be in this passage of Scripture. But then, not only are we to prepare our minds for action and be sober-minded, but notice what else he says here in verse 13. Preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice here the command. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this hope here that Peter is talking about, this isn't just pie in the sky, wishful thinking. 
But this hope that Peter calls him to is a sure hope. And it is built upon the character of God and His trustworthiness. It's not the type of hope that when you go out fishing, you say, well, I hope it doesn't rain today. Or I hope that the wind doesn't blow as I'm fishing. That's not the type of hope that he's talking about. The hope that Peter is describing here is a living hope. That's how he describes it in verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And he goes on to describe that hope. It is a hope of inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for us. It is the hope of salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. It is a sure hope of God's grace that will be brought to us upon Christ's second coming. That's what Peter is saying here. That we are to get our minds ready for action and we are to set our hope and fix our hope on the second coming of Christ because at that point, the grace of God will be brought to us. You say, well... I thought we received grace when we were first saved. You did. We did receive grace when we first believed. We were saved by grace. But salvation, and so many times I think in the American church we think of salvation as a one-time event and that's it. We receive grace at the moment of our salvation and all throughout our life as Christians, we are being given this grace that we might be kept from straying and going back into the world. God is continuing to lavish upon us His grace. But there's also a future grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Christ when our salvation is consummated. When we are free from this, bo this body of death and we receive resurrected bodies and we receive glorification. We need to fix our eyes upon that future hope that we have in Jesus Christ. When we will receive all of our salvation, the resurrected body, the whole nine yards, the problem today is that so many times, so many times, we don't fix our eyes upon the coming of Christ. So many times, I believe the problem in the American church today is that most of the time, the church in America is asleep. We are so weighed down with the cares of this world that we have lost sight of Christ and His imminent return. The church in America has no eye on eternity. She's not sober. She's not prepared. I see this all the time. You say, well, how can you be so sure of this? I have went to church after church. And, and not this church. But there's many churches that I've been to where you hear nothing about Christ. You hear nothing about grace and salvation and eternal matters. Instead, you hear of five ways that you can make your marriage better, or five ways to become a better, better father. Yes, the Scripture speaks to those issues. But where are the, the, the message of yesteryear? Where's the message that Edwards and, and Ravenhill and, and all, Whitfield and all of those guys and Spurgeon preached? A message that was fixed and all about your soul and eternity. So many preachers do not have eternity stamped upon their eyes. And most churchgoers are no different these days. We are so mesmerized by the toys and the trinkets of this world that we rarely think about eternity. I've had people that are professing Christians tell me about sermons. Well, I don't want to talk about all of that stuff in the future. I just want something for the here and now just to get me through the daily life. That's not how the Bible uh, views the Christian life. You want to get through every day today? Then you fix your eyes on eternity. You let eternity be stamped upon your eyes. And that's what Peter is calling these believers to do who are exiles, who are, who are scattered abroad, living in the midst of persecution in a pagan world. He doesn't tell them to go out and just try to live a better life and, and you know, find a little dwelling somewhere where you can escape the persecution or anything like that. He tells them to be sober-minded. He tells them to prepare their minds for action and set their hope 
upon Jesus Christ. That set their hope upon the grace that will be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How, when we do that, think about the motivation that gives us in life. Think about the joy that brings to life, knowing that this isn't all there is. Guys, we have forgotten about eternity. May we not get so bogged down with the things of this world. You know, the older I get, and some of you may say, well, you're not that old. Well, I'm 36. But the older I get, the one thing that I realize is this world is quickly fading away. And not only that, but I'm fading away in this body. I can't do what I did when I was in my 20s. I can't move the way I did when I was in my 20s. One day, all of this is going to be rolled up like a scroll. All of this, time will be no more. And how foolish is it if we just live each and every day with our eyes fixed on the world rather than eternity. I believe that this is one of the reasons why there's so much ungodliness in churches today. And in, in ungodliness and in many professing believers' lives. Because they're so fixated on the things of this world that they are not fixated on Christ and His return. They're so fixated on the world that they've allowed the world into their lives instead of living holy lives. We must be fixed upon eternity, upon the second coming of Christ and the grace that will be brought to us. As Leonard Ravenhill one of the preachers I like to listen to, one of the things that he said, this life is nothing more than a dressing room for eternity. How are you living your life now? As Peter goes on, as he tells them how they're to fix their minds upon the grace that will be brought to them at the revelation of Christ, he goes on because he's going, he's, this is the motivation for holy living. And he goes on to verse 14, once again reminding them of who they are in Christ. He says in verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Notice what he calls them there, as obedient children. Now, in the Scriptures, you find this word children used many times. But before we are a child of God, what are we? Ephesians 2.2 2 describes us as sons of disobedience. Or as 1 John 3 says, we are children before we are a Christian. But now that we are saved, now that the grace of God, we have known that we've been born again, now we are obedient children. There in some circles of Christianity today will say, well, it's all by grace. And now you don't have to, to do anything. You just have to just live your life. Do whatever you want. You're saved by grace. Antinomianism. Anti-law. They disregard the law of God as though it doesn't mean anything. We are not saved by keeping the law. But here's the thing. When God saves us, we will want to obey His commandments. And so we will be obedient children. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Right? That's what we are to do. We are obedient children. This is what Christians are. This isn't an option. If you are a Christian, then you will be obedient to God and His commandments. You will be obedient to Him. And Peter is laying that out here, who they are. They are obedient children. And so in light of that, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, don't go on sinning that grace may abound. Don't go on living the life that you once lived in, in sin and, and drunkenness and, 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 all, and sexual immorality. All these sins that Peter lists in 1 Peter. Don't go on living like your former ways. As Christians, we are to live a different life. And here it is in verse 15. But as He who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. That is not an option for the Christian. A Christian is... This is a, this is a characteristic of a Christian. If you are a Christian, your life will be marked by holiness. 
As Hebrews 12.14 talks about, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You say, well, you're talking there about works. You're saying that, well, if I have to do this in order to see God. What I'm saying is, is that if you are a true Christian, then your life will be different from the world. Your life will be separate from the world. It will be radically different from the way the world lives. Is that how people view your life? When they see you and they encounter you, do they think there's something different about her? There's something different about him. He doesn't watch the things that I watch. He doesn't laugh at the things that I laugh at. He doesn't participate in the things that I participate in. As Christians, we are to be holy. And notice what he says here. You're, he who has called you is holy, and you also are to be holy in all of your conduct. We are not to be holy just when we come to church on Sunday morning. We are to be holy in all of our conduct. The way we relate to our kids. The thoughts that we think. The way we relate to our wives. The way we relate to uh, perhaps an unbelieving member of our family. Or the way we relate to our employers. We are to live our lives in such a manner that is different in all of our conduct. We are to live holy lives. Why is that? Since it is written, verse 16, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Guys, one of the things that I believe, and as, as a preacher, I think about these things all the time. What is the problem in the American church? And one of the problems that I see is that we don't know God. We don't understand who God is. We have... We have brought down God and made a, a God into an image that is really no God at all. We don't truly, a lot of times in the church today, worship God. We worship a, a figment of our imagination. We worship a lot of times a, a God that is not described in the Bible. We need to go back to the Bible and let God reveal Himself to us. And here He reveals Himself to us. God is holy. He is a holy God. And if we're going to serve God and live for God and be children of God, then we will reflect God. And He is holy. Now think about many times the way people talk about God these days. There's no reverence. There's no awe. I heard a story about John MacArthur. He tells about a well-known charismatic pastor who told him that sometimes in the morning when he's shaving, he said Jesus comes to him in the bathroom and puts his arm around him and they talk together. And John MacArthur's reply was this, and you keep shaving? <laughs> I mean, that's how we have viewed God in America. We have forgotten how great God is, how holy God is. We, th we treat God as though He is our next door neighbor or our best friend. We have all of these disrespectful names, these nicknames that we call God. God is a holy God. And any time in Scripture when you see God's people or someone coming into the presence of God, what happens? They don't just walk in there and say, hey, what's going on? They fall to their face. Remember Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6? What did happen when, during, in that incident when he saw God high and lifted up and the angels or the, uh, the cherubim uh, saying, Holy, holy, holy. He says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Woe is me. That's what he said. He didn't treat God like He was common or like He was like one of us. He saw Him as holy and He fell on His face. As believers, we need to come back to the Scriptures. And we need to remember who it is that we serve. Who, it, who God is. He is a holy God. And if we claim to, to live for Him and that we claim to be one of His children, then we too are to live a holy life. We must not be flippant, uh, flippant in our understanding 
in our attitude towards God. He is a holy God. Guys, when we live in this world, and it seems to be, it seems like darkness is just coming down around us at light speed. It seems like the culture is changing at light speed. What type of people ought we to be? Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. What type of people are we to be? We are to be holy in all of our conduct. But this holiness that, that, Paul, that Peter is talking about here in the Christian life doesn't come from just it in neutral and coasting. We, we have to be sober-minded. We have to prepare our minds for action and realize that we are in war. We have to set our minds upon Christ. Set our minds fully upon the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul does something similar to this in Colossians 3. In Colossians 3, he tells them to put away sexual immorality. Put away lying and anger. And he lists all of these sins. But you know what he does before he tells them to do those things? He said, set your mind on things above. That's what he tells them to do. Set their mind on things above. If we would just fix our minds upon Christ and get our minds out of this world and fix our minds upon Christ and prepare for action and, and do battle, oh, what holy people we would be. Now, it's not because we do this in and of ourselves. It is the grace of God working within us. God gives us the power. to He set us free to live this holy life. You know, salvation is monergistic. That is, it is the work of God. But when it comes to sanctification, we might say that it is synergistic. It is God working in us, but we cooperate with God now that we have been set free from our sin. We are to live a holy life. I wish we could look all throughout Peter. I would encourage you to go and just read there is so much more to be said. But I'm going to stop right there in verse 16. But if you were to go on, just in 1 Peter, I mean, the call is to come out from among them and be separate, basically. The call is to that, that you are a holy priesthood, a holy nation. You are a people for His own possession. You are a, a people that is to live different. You are to abstain from the passions of the flesh, He says. That's the type of people that we are to be. And my question to you this morning is this. Are you living a holy life? Are you living a holy life in your thoughts, in your actions throughout the week? At work, are you living a holy life? In your homes, are you living a holy life? If there is no holiness in your life, you better check your Christianity to see whether or not you are truly saved. The warning is clear. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. For those who persist in sin and never repent, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is only those who are holy. Now, once again, I am not talking about a works-based salvation. We are saved by grace. But what are we when we are saved by God and when He causes us to be born again? We are His, as Ephesians 2.10 says, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. You know, if we want the world to know that we are a Christian, what is the one way that we can show the world how Christianity is different from the other religions in this world? How God is the one true God? It's not by putting a bumper sticker on your car. It's not by wearing a Christian t-shirt or going to a Christian concert or listening to K-Love or anything like that. How you show that you are a Christian and point people to God is you live a holy life. That is the mark of a true Christian. Is holiness in your life. If you do not have holiness this morning, and God is convicting you of your sin, and you realize you need grace, you need the forgiveness of God for all the sins that you've committed, know this, that if you will repent 
and turn from your sins and trust Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, He will save you. He will give you the righteousness that you do not have. And that's what we need to be able to stand before a holy and righteous God one day. We need to be clothed in the perfection of Christ. The righteousness of Christ. And second of all, I charge each and every Christian, including myself here this morning, to live a holy life. Don't get caught up in all the things of the world, but strive for holiness. Strive to be like Christ in everything. When you wake up, know that you are in a battle. Prepare. And notice the motivation for this all. This isn't legalism. Notice that grace is the motivation. Set your hope fully upon the grace that will be brought to you. You have been set apart by God's grace. You are elect exiles by God's grace. God has caused you to be children of obedience. Grace is on its way. And you have an inheritance. All of those things are of grace. And because what God has done for you in Christ Jesus, He who is holy calls you and I to live a holy life. Let's stand as we pray. And I'm going to turn everything over to Bill. But I challenge you to live a holy life. Be different from this world that is so radically depraved. Live a holy life. Let's pray. Father, as we come to You this morning, Lord, I pray that this passage of Scripture, that You will write it upon our hearts. Father, You would cause us to live holy lives. And that we would not, Lord, toy with sin or the the evil that is in this world, but Father, I pray that we would come out and be a people that reflect You and Your holiness. Father, I pray that You would grant us Your grace, that You would give us the strength to live a life of obedience because we know that we cannot do this apart from Your grace. And so, Father, we just ask that You would just change our lives and, and stir our hearts and our minds, Lord. So many times it's so easy to become sluggish. Father, I pray that You would help us to prepare our minds and be sober-minded, watchful and alert, praying at all times, resting and standing firm in the strength that You provide. And may, Father, we be people with eternity stamped upon our eyes. And may our eyes be fixed upon the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. May we focus on this world, but may we focus on eternity. And if there's anybody here this morning without Christ, I pray that You would convict them and bring them to salvation today. Grant them repentance and the faith to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.